This content is brought to you by iTrust Capital, which is a great platform that allows you to easily invest in crypto without worrying about taxes or fees. iTrust Capital allows you to invest in crypto through an individual retirement account or IRA. IRAs are tax sheltered accounts, which means all of your crypto is tax free and can even grow tax free over time. The process of signing up with iTrust Capital is very easy. They have a mobile app, they have 25 plus cryptocurrencies, they have full support, a dedicated team ready to help you. And it is free, and once again, 100% free to sign up with iTrust Capital. There are no hidden fees and there's no monthly subscription or membership. They also have great security. They utilize Coinbase custody for all their custodial services. So you don't have to worry. It is institutional grade crypto custody that they are using. This is a great platform. Uh, once again, it is free to sign up. So visit the link in the description and go check it out. If you sign up with my link, you get a $100 funding bonus. So once again, check the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is J.W. Verrett, who's an associate professor of law at George Mason University, a consultant at Veritas Financial Analytics, and a former SEC Advisory Committee member. J.W., great to have you on the show. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, JW, uh, you know, you really piqued my interest when you wrote an article, uh, the SEC's abuse of the Howey test. So <laughs> uh, certainly want to talk about the SEC and crypto re regulations, but I would love to get to know you a bit better. Uh, can you tell us about your background, where you're from, where, where'd you grow up? Uh, I'm from Louisiana, so I'm a, I'm a full-blooded Cajun. I put hot sauce on everything. I mean, I put hot sauce on salad. Uh, I eat, uh, you know, maybe not ice cream, but uh, yeah, we might, might give it a try. <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, I've been a law professor where I, uh, for, for 12 years now, maybe 14 years, how long, I don't know, I'm getting old. Um, 14 years as a law professor teaching corporate securities and banking law. And I spent a little time on Capitol Hill for a couple of years. Uh, advising a, a, the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee on oversight of the Federal Reserve and the SEC. And um, uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, I, I, I have uh, four boys and two dogs and a cat. Uh, so I got a full house here. Uh, I'm, basi I'm basically Bob Saget at this point. Um, you're not the real Bob Saget, but the character he played. <laughs> so, uh, so that's me, man. Uh, and now I'm, I'm getting more and more involved in the fight for for uh, uh, for digital asset privacy and the fight for for digital asset liberty uh, and uh, it's, it's it's similar to fights I've been in, involved with for a long time uh, you know I fought for crowdfunding when crowdfunding first came along I, I fought for fintech innovation when that started to happen although that was very limited in that it was always limited by the fact that it was all built on top of the traditional payment layer uh, the the dinosaur payment system. Uh, but I did my best to fight those fights, and and um, you know, for the most part, I've I've lost every libertarian securities law fight I've ever jumped into. But the first one I'm going to win is the fight to defend my friends in the digital asset community. So let's let's do it, man. Awesome. Um, but qu quick note, uh, I'm a huge fan of Cajun food, and I love New Orleans, and uh, I you know I, I would love that. If I could every year, just go down there and spend a couple of weeks and just have some good food. And uh, one of the things my wife and I really love is the Mufaletta sandwich. Um, it's oh yeah, so good. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. We need to have uh, more, uh, you know, more DeFi and Bitcoin conferences in New Orleans, man. We need to add that to the circuit. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, all right, what was your first encounter with Bitcoin and crypto, and what was your aha moment? Well, um, so back when I first started working in at the House Financial Services Committee, um, I, I was kind of early in my career teaching and working at a think tank a little bit. M my colleagues at the think tank were Hester Peirce and Jerry Brito. Um, so Jerry Brito was telling me he was our he was at the time his focus was technology broadly, um, and he was like, man. Cryptocurrencies, it's cool. You got to learn about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's cool. So, okay, Jerry. So, Jerry had a report on it. 
I don't know, maybe 2012. And I read it and I said, wow, this is cool, man. From a, from a libertarian perspective, this is fascinating. It's empowering. Uh, and it, 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 it promotes a financial liberty, financial privacy uh, with, you know, with immutable censorship resistant money, digital money. Um, really cool. Uh, so when I went to the Hill, uh, there were a few members of Congress still starting to get interested in Bitcoin, wanted to learn more. Um, and so I, I, I said, hey, Jerry, you want to come do a briefing? And I think that, that might have been one of the first briefings that, that, that Jerry did on the Hill back in 2013. Now, the other part of the story is I should have said, hey, Jerry, how do I buy it? What should I do? But I did not do that. I didn't buy Bitcoin until a year ago, uh, until maybe six months ago. Um, uh, I should have bought a long, I should have, I should have asked old Jerry how, how that worked. Um, but you know what, what's fascinating to me is the conversation in Washington is so much the same. I remember 2013 members of Congress said, Hey, isn't this going to be used for illicit finance? Uh, and Jerry said, oh, uh, compared to what compared to cash, we have to compare it to cash. If we're going to have that discussion, they said, Oh yeah, I got makes sense. And did you know that by the nature of pseudonymous, tra pseudonymous transactions, once you have the public key for a transaction, you can follow it all along the chain. So, oh, I did not know that. That's fascinating. We're still having that conversation. Why are we still talking about that nine years later? I, so I, I just remember that briefing and, and um, nine years later, we're still having the same conversation. I don't understand it. But Washington is slow to learn, I guess. Yeah, um, the, the, the good thing, I guess you, you could say, is that there's more dialogue, more members of Congress interested in now and some are putting forth bills, but to your point, there's the same old question keeps popping up. Um, and maybe there's an agenda behind some, some of that from some folks, right? Yeah, I guess you could, back in 2013, you could chalk it up to just ignorance and a need to learn. Yeah. But today, it's, it, it, that excuse doesn't really hold anymore. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, what are you holding your crypto portfolio? What's that? What do you hold in your crypto portfolio? Do you do you hold anything aside from maybe some Bitcoin? Um, uh, you know, um, uh, that's that's a little uh, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, a number of layer ones, um, and then uh, some other things that are, um, shall we say, decentralized. Um, uh, some financial things that are decentralized that I probably shouldn't get specific about. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been having fun playing in the whole space. Uh, and, and I think that um, part of my interest is that if I'm going to write about it and I'm going to talk about it, the best way to learn it is to do it. You have to do it. Um, you have no choice but to do it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think if somebody's going to write about what's going on in DeFi and how that intersects with the regulatory environment, if you haven't actually um, LP to pull, uh, then you have no business. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, let's talk about Biden's President Biden's crypto executive order, uh, which came out just about a couple of weeks ago. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Many are seeing this as a positive and move in the right direction, a call to action for many of the regulatory agencies to uh, start working on getting this right. And even just the other day, uh, Janet Yellen was interviewed by CNBC, and she started talking about innovation and, and move, getting this right. So it seems like we're moving in the right direction. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the whole situation? Yeah, I remember her confirmation hearing. I followed her for a long time because uh, back in 2014, 2015, I was responsible for house oversight of the Fed when she was the chair. Uh, we had a few breakfasts together with some tough questions. And uh, so I know her well. I know she's very smart. She made a very, um, very, uh, she was a great opponent, a great adversary. When you're in policy fights, you know, you want a good adversary who's smart, knows what they're doing. Um, I was disappointed in her comments at confirmation about cryptocurrency because they were very dismissive. Um, and now they're constructive. That's a great thing. That's a good thing. I'll, I'll applaud that and I'll give a high five to those constructive comments. Uh, I will not agree with her that she's the judge of what is innovative and what's not. Um, but but it's a move in the right direction and I'll take it. Um, do you have any thoughts on when we may see the fruits of this executive order? Maybe it's a year from now or a few years or maybe six months? Well, um, 
I think that the artificial timeline, I wouldn't look at the artificial timelines necessarily set in the executive order as being solid, as being set in stone. Uh, agencies are always late. Uh, even with timelines that are set in statute, which are much stronger on agencies, um, you know, I think the SEC missed and the Fed missed most of the deadlines set in the Dodd-Frank Act for rulemaking. So it'll probably break the deadlines. It'll take a while. Um, generally speaking on the executive order, um, I was apprehensive until it came out like most people. Uh, but, you know, the general theme is that uh, this is not this is not an escalation of war. This is not an elevation of regulatory tension. Um, this is a nuanced executive order. So it's about the best we could hope for. And you, you could tell that there was a ton of behind the scenes engagement from the people I really respect a lot in this space that I'm a fan of, you know, Jake, Jake Shervinsky and, and Jerry Brito and Kristen Smith and, and, and everybody, um, Sheila Warren and all these people that are thought leaders in Washington on, the, on these issues. Um, so, you know, I think it's, we're in a good place. Um, now the independent agencies are gonna, I think are just gonna do what they already planned on doing and probably use this as cover for that, mm. which means generally speaking, CFTC is pretty constructive. This is uh, this is uh, Chair Benham is somebody we can work with. Chair uh, Gensler is not, you know, and we could talk more about that. But yeah, that was, that was going to be my next question. Um, you know, every all eyes are on the SEC and their the things that they're doing. Uh, there's so much going on with BlockFi getting fined, Coinbase lending getting blocked. We have the Ripple lawsuit, uh, which is high profile, um, the library lawsuit as well. And everyone is trying to get their Bitcoin spot ETF applications approved. Um, what? I guess let's start with from a macro perspective before we get into the micro. How do you think the SEC is handling crypto regulations at this point? Um, they could give us guidance. They could give us certainty. And they have made a strategic decision not to do so. So that's the overarching issue and the concern that I have. Um, they know better at a staff level, the staff level discussions. Now, the staff doesn't make the ultimate decisions, the big picture decisions. The chairman and the commission does. At a staff level, they get it. They're smart. They get it. Um, I've talked to people at Corp Fin. I've talked to people at uh, NIM. And, and I've talked to other lawyers externally that have talked to them. And the general consensus is that they get the nuance of these issues at a staff level. At the, at the chairman level, we get speeches with talking points. And that's a problem for me. Because I know that he knows better because I've watched his MIT uh, videos, his courses, yeah. where he has a very a much more nuanced view of crypto and kind of a, I think ultimately a neutral view on it. He's not pro or con, he's just kind of neutral in that, those lectures. But there were a lot of detail in those lectures. So he knows better, but he's sticking to political talking points right now, which doesn't help anybody. Now, why do you think that there's such a dichotomy? Because to your, your point, I've seen those videos as well. Many folks in the crypto community have seen those. And a, a lot thought, including myself, that he was going to be someone who was maybe better than Jay Clayton, so to speak, because he understood it. And uh, But he came in more aggressive and heavy-handed. Um, is it that the SEC is a little bit beholden to incumbents? Is it something personal for him? Um, what do you think? Well, I, I, uh, a lot of people try to get in his head. I hesitate to do that because that's probably not fair. I, I prefer to just focus on meeting him on the field of battle mm -hmm. um, in, in a policy level. Um, and yeah, so I won't speculate why he's doing what he's doing. I, I just, I disagree with it, with the fundamental approach. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to meet him on the, on the policy field of battle, which, which uh, I like to use metaphors like that because it's just comment letters to the agency that you're drafting that aren't really sexy in day-to-day -day life. But I like to use the battle or the arena metaphor for that. Um, and eventually get involved in some litigation against the agency because I think it's warranted. Speaking of litigation, um, there was just a report actually earlier today that Grayscale, um, they said they would take legal action, potentially take legal action, against the SEC if their Bitcoin spot ETF is uh, approved, excuse me, disapproved or, or not approved. Um, and recently I interviewed former SEC commissioner, Joseph Grunfest, and he said 
the applicants can absolutely sue the SEC about uh, regarding this. Do, do you think we're going to start seeing all these companies who are trying to get a Bitcoin spot ETF approved start filing lawsuits? Well, um, when you look at how Canada has approved it, when you look at how Germany's approved it, um, and you compare it to our obstinate refusal to approve it, when you look at the decision to approve a futures ETF, but deny a spot ETF, uh, when you look at um, other ETFs that have, have been approved in the past, that I don't want to cast aspersions on any one player in the industry, but let's say there, we could find a half dozen ETF approvals that are like we're clearly always going to be negative net present value prospects for the people buying into it. Um, when you when you consider it in that light, when you look at some really well crafted Administrative Procedures Act arguments that have been made by Davis Polk on behalf of of Grayscale uh, that they submitted to the agency in December, I like the odds. I hope they sue. I like the odds. I like to throw in an amicus in support if the uh, SEC will let me. Um, and, and that's not because I'm someone who feels like I need to hold my Bitcoin through an ETF. I, I don't. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very much a uh, not your keys, not your coin kind of guy. But uh, that's going to be key to onboarding a lot of retail people that, that uh, you know, don't want to go that route. Yep. Um, and I, I think that, that a part of the um, uh, we need mass, mass retail adoption, and that requires an intermediary institution to like this and and so I fully support it, and I think the SEC is being unfair, um, uh, and and uh, and so um, I'd love to see them. I love to. I'm, I'm glad I, I hadn't seen that news today, but I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. I hope Grayscale, uh, you know, if they jump in the fight, I'll put on my armor and jump in as well. Um, now being part of the SEC ad advisory uh, committee, uh, can you tell us about? what you experienced and how things went and maybe some of the things, comments that you submitted? Yeah, sure. Um, it was a terrific experience. The investor advisory committee was created. Um, it was codified in the Dodd-Frank Act, but it, it had existed for a long time before that. And it's a venue where um, institutional investors, pension funds, a few academics here and there, uh, folks from the uh, institutional investor community, from Fidelity, we had a we had a brilliant um, a colleague from, who was former general counsel at Vanguard, who I learned a lot from about the Forty Act and about all kinds of things. Uh, 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 just a great group that deliberates, that provides suggestions to the SEC. The SEC is required to at least consider. They don't have to do it, but they have to consider it. Holds hearings with a. Chairman, chairman and commissioners come to the hearing. Um, uh, I don't know why, for some reason, Siri keeps trying to jump into our conversation. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe she has something she wants to say. <laughs> Sorry for that background. But it's a terrific group to deliberate. And uh, we had a great uh, discussion about digital assets uh, back in November. And we heard from some of the leaders in the industry. Uh, you know, uh, we... we um, uh, some of the people that I respect a lot and uh, uh, folks from Gemini and uh, we had some folks from Circle um, and, uh, you know, it was clear that the, the, they're all just hungry. They're all very sophisticated. This is not the Wild West. They're all very sophisticated securities lawyers who are hungry, who are working in digital asset and, and, and Web3 and they're hungry for guidance and they want just some clear rules of the road. That's all they want. Um, and they, they've made clear that aspects of the 33 and 34 and 40 acts uh, and the 75 act amendments specific to broker dealers uh, just don't fit. They don't fit. And other better crafted rules would fit better and accomplish the SEC's mission better. It's a small ask. It's a reasonable ask. It's the kind of thing the SEC's done in the past with accommodations to its rules for various things. They, you know, took them a while to allow prospectus delivery over email. Um, for too long, actually. It took them a while to allow CEOs to engage with investors over Twitter and social media. They said, oh, no, 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 just file it on Edgar. That's fine. And it took a while for us to convince the SEC, no, no, no. If investors can get information faster from social media engagement. But eventually they came around. This is the same sort of thing. It's just kind of a slow, dogged 
uh, uh, resistance to reasonable changes. And that's why I did what you one thing you referenced. I uh, wrote up a uh, proposal to the SEC. You can file public proposals for rulemaking. And I filed a public proposal just asking the SEC to open up for public comment uh, a, a, a notice about digital assets and get public comment about the unique issues facing digital assets. I tried to get cute and I call it my digital asset regulation genesis block proposal. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope that they'll do that. I hope they'll think about it. Um, you know, we'll see on my way out. I reminded the chairman that, uh, that proposal was out there and, uh, I posted that on social media and it got a lot of, uh, got a lot of hits, which is great. Uh, I think that's probably where I found you, where yeah. you found me, but yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and I just to confirm, is that related to the article you wrote about, uh, the SEC's abuse of the Howey test? Where you went into some details of the Ripple lawsuit and things like that. Yeah, that's one of the issues. That's one of the concerns um, that uh, I think that the SEC is really stretching the Howey test. This is a test that's been stretched a lot over the last 80 years already. Even before crypto came along, it was a test that was increasingly being stretched. Just to kind of describe it very, very basically here, the Howey test for an investment contract, which therefore makes something a security which has to be registered with the SEC for a public offering, uh, has four parts. An investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit solely from the efforts of a promoter or a third party. Okay, so here's what circuit courts and district courts in the SEC have done to that test. An investment of money no longer means money. It means anything of value. Okay. Uh, in a common enterprise, how do we define common enterprise? At this point, it basically, do, does it mean a common enterprise like uh, centralized management under a board of directors, something that strict? No, it's much more flexible for the SEC than that. And at the end of the day, the common enterprise is just, we all hope to make money off of this thing, which is really just conflating test number two with test number three, uh, with the expectation of profits. So the second test, what is it not really mean anything? And only the third test matters? I don't know. That's kind of where we are. And then the fourth test, solely from the efforts of a promoter or a third party, well, solely no longer means solely. That's what the Supreme Court said in 1946. Solely no longer means solely. It means, well, for some circuits, mostly. Mm, a lot. I, I don't know. It's been, it's been, the bar has been increasingly lowered and lowered, such that the SEC and its guidance asserts that if you've got a foundation helping to fix some bugs in the code, but for the most part, you know, you're tokens or an investment in a blockchain that's totally decentralized and uh, whose value derived from just mass user adoption and developer adoption and growth in the nodes and all of that, um, they try to catch it under the fourth element of the, of the Howey test, even though I think it was not what the Supreme Court intended. So my view is if Ripple wants to keep fighting, great. That's great. And I've totally supported that fight. Because I think eventually, even if they lose in the district court, I think this is something SCOTUS could take up, Supreme Court could take up and reshape the Howey test, which is why, um, you know, at the end of the day, the SEC might regret their overexpansive approach to Howey, but that's just my view. And it's easy for me on the sidelines to say, yeah, fight. You know, I know it's hard for folks like Library and Ripple to fight, but um, but it, for those that want to fight, I want to do whatever I can to help. Sure. Um, you know, but here's here's the tricky part, and and, and I've spoken to um, Commissioner Purse Hester Purse a couple of times, and and she said, you know, one of the things she struggles with is trying to get the other folks at the SEC to think of um, not that this token itself as being a security, but rather the way it's packaged. And the the SEC is claiming in that lawsuit that all XRP is a security, even in secondary markets, and. To your point, on a, it, it's on a globally distributed decentralized network, which I find um, intellectually dishonest. If you want to say certain XRP that were sold by Ripple back in 2013 to 2015 was a security, I think that makes sense. But to say the XRP I hold in my wallet right now, which can move by the entire market following Bitcoin as a security, seems really ridiculous. What are your thoughts on that? I know it gets into the details of the lawsuit, but any thoughts on that yeah. distinction? Well, there's a philosophical question about securities law is that 
Is it once a security, always a security, unless it delists from wherever it's listed? Mm -hmm. um, that's one question. And some people say, and the, the, a speech from Bill Hinman suggested that it might be the case that once a security, not always a security, which is an interesting idea. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it, so Lewis Cohen, um, who, who's at uh, DLX Law, has an interesting thought that, yeah, interesting idea, but that's unworkable for securities law. It might be a good defense in the XRP case, but it might be unworkable for securities law generally because you would never really know if you were or were not a security if it was morphable like that which I think he's got a good point. I still want to use this as a defense for Ripple. Uh, I'll, I'll take any shield I can get to protect us from abuse of the Howey test. But I think Lewis Cohen has a good point about that as a long-term rule. Look, it, it just comes down to, we need a new test. We have to have a new test. The Howey test wasn't written in stone. It was just a Supreme Court's idea of how to figure out how to define this um, in an era that was very different. So do you, do you feel, um, we know Congress makes the laws. Is it Congress that has to step in here and, and maybe it's under this ex executive order that the other agencies put the pressure on the SEC to say, come up with something new that's relevant to digital assets in 2022 versus something that's 90 years old, uh, where the folks who put that together couldn't fathom uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies and so forth? Or is it the SEC they can do it right now if they, they wanted to, uh, or will Congress have to give that uh, mandate, so to speak? Uh, the SEC could help. Um, the SEC is going to be bound by the original Howey test. Um, and to the extent they want to pull back their prior kind of overexpansion, I think they could and take a, take a definition, promulgate a definition through guidance that, that uh, constricts some of that growth. Um, and, and says what it's going to do in the future. Um, Congress could change it. Uh, it's unlikely in the short term, be, just because the recent comments about, about Senator Gillibrand, Gillibrand and Senator Loomis working together on a new crypto bill, which is great. I love the bipartisan approach and it's constructive and they want to listen to those of us in the community that want to talk to them. Uh, I was really, I was kind of nerdy, nerding out, fanning out because uh, I responded to, 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 I gave some Twitter comments to, to, to Senator Lummis and she responded back. She replied, thanks for the comments. Really like it. I was like, oh my God, you're my hero. But, uh, but look, what they said about their bill is we're not going to touch the Howard test. It's hmm. just in a bipartisan bill. It's not possible. So I don't see Congress doing that in the near term. Um, I'm not sure I would want Chairman Ginsler to implement a rule like a, a bill like that anyway. Yeah. because I think that he would not do anything consistent with that approach. Um, so maybe we got to wait for the next chairman. Chairman, you know, typically, I think on average, they are chairs for what, three years, maybe three and a half years. Um, so, you know, in a couple of years, we might have a new chairman. Uh, and there's a continued movement in the Democratic Party uh, that's pro-crypto. And so even presuming the, the White House doesn't change hands, uh, I think we could have a new chairman that's a Democrat, but still pro-crypto, willing to work with Republicans who tend to be more pro-crypto historically, but that is evening out in a very hopeful sign on the political side. So I, I continue to have hope. In the short term, we've got to fight and we've got to defend ourselves and help other people defend themselves and kind of take a wag me approach to, to being in the foxhole together. Uh, but in the long term, I think there's a ton of hope for for positive, constructive policy change. For sure. Um, I, 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 I'm going to ask you kind of a prediction question here, but more of the implications of, of a certain outcome. And that is, do you feel Ripple can win this lawsuit? And if they do win it, um, do you think it sets the precedence uh, for the rest of the market? Or, well, outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, to be able to fight back against the SEC uh, in the event the SEC goes after them? Well, if they won on the fair notice defense alone, mm -hmm. then that's not a precedent that's going to change the Howey test. That just changes fair notice. Uh, so that only helps those that are pretty old sure. and that probably are, already have protection just from statute of limitations. So if that's how they win, it probably doesn't have the broader implications, but I'd love for them to win on that basis. Um, even if they lose at the district court, there's still the appellate court, there's still SCOTUS, and I would advise them 
keep fighting, keep fighting. Um, and, uh, and, and, and otherwise, you know, if there is a big win that, that changes interpretation of how we test, that would be the best outcome. Mm. Um, there's a question I want to ask you about, uh, this, this is maybe a bit awkward. Uh, some people kind of dismiss it as maybe some conspiracy theories, but nevertheless, there are some important facts that are out there, which show some possible, uh, impropriety on Bill Hinman's part, as well as Jay Clayton, um, Ethereum getting a, the not a security speech and connections to Simpson Thatcher, which is paying Bill Hinman $15 million. Jay Clayton on his way out uh, on his last days files a lawsuit against Ripple and then he's gone. And a lot of the folks who are working with him, they also resign. So it just seems like there's some level of impropriety here. Once again, put, put, no proof here, but any thoughts on that? And, and, and obviously a lot of in the world that we live in, in social media, it's also happening with meme stocks, uh, meme stocks. Uh, you have the, a lot of crypto folks, XRP army folks, uh, they're on social media and this seems like a bad PR for, uh, the SEC. Uh, any thoughts on this entire situation? Yeah, I, I have a few thoughts and, and, and they, they're, um, they're, some of them are all different. So First point, um, just on 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 Clayton. I, I knew him well. Uh, I still consider him a friend. I think he's a he's a solid guy. Uh, he's a he's an ethical he's an ethical person. I didn't know Henman very well. I met him a couple times. Um, I was very disappointed in Jay's decision to bring the case against Ripple. I argued with him in person. I, you know, there were a couple times where we would have drinks together and. You know, I would just talk his ear off for like an hour and a half about ICOs and, and about um, trying to find some better guidance and about the Howey test and how the Howey test is broken. And, and he, he, was, he did not agree with me, but I've had those dis debates with him and discussions. I was deeply disappointed in his decision to bring the Ripple case, but I think he's an ethical guy. I don't think he'd be a part of anything untoward. So I don't, I don't think that's the case with him. I don't know him very well. Um, I, I, I see the same things you see on social media. I just, I don't want to comment on it because I don't know anything about it. Um, you know, outside of his issue and whatever, generally speaking, um, could, could, could the ethics rules do a better job of those post-law firm retirement packages when you go into a regulator? Absolutely. I, I think whatever rules we have now are not working. We have to change them. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know that Bill Hinman did anything unethical. I, I don't want to say that he did because I just I don't, I don't know. I don't have any reason to um, believe that. And, and I don't like that focus anyway, because um, I, I, uh, I think that uh, Ethereum XRP communities uh, and everyone else in this space needs to work together to, to fight for each other. I just did an interview with John Deaton that I really enjoyed. And, you know, he told me, he, he uh, I didn't realize this. He said, you know, I own more Ethereum than XRP. People don't know that. Uh, and I said, no, I didn't. I didn't know that either. And he says, I'm a I'm a wag me guy, too. I thought it I thought it was going to be awkward, but it wasn't. It was like, yeah, you're a wag me guy. I am, too. I'm for defending everybody. Let's defend library. Let's, uh, you know, let's protect Ethereum. Um, and and uh, I really like that way of looking at things. For sure. I, I think we're all on the same side here as far as uh uh, crypto projects and companies and so forth. And I myself am a Ethereum holder, Bitcoin holder, want to see all of them do well. Obviously, yeah. uh, that, that will benefit me financially. Um, uh, but, it, you know, obviously these things, the accusations um, and, and, the, and all these uh, connections and so forth are still, I, I think a lot of people are angry about it. And, and it's a very interesting world we live in now, going back to the social media aspect and uh, Metcalf's law network adoption. And now, you, you know, folks are congregated behind uh, certain tokens or large communities, and they have a financial incentive. Um, on the other side with stocks, you, you see uh, folks on Reddit, and, and we know about the GameStop short squeeze situation and all that. Um, it feels like the SEC has got their hands full and they are not, I don't know how to articulate this well, but they need to maybe come into the 2022. It feels like they're lagging behind and in the world that's changing uh, around us with technology and so forth. 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, network effects, network externalities. That's part of the reason why Commissioner Purse's safe harbor makes so much sense to me. That you know, you take your time with some uh, disclosure required, but uh, get some exemption from some of the more burdensome aspects of 33 and 34 Act that don't make any sense for these projects, and see if in three years you're sufficiently decentralized that you're not a security. Um, it, it, I think it's brilliant, and it's 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 securities law that that links well with Metcalf's law with network externality uh, issues that are at the heart of you know the, the blockchain competition, the, the layer one competitions. Um, so the, I'm, I'm a big fan of that approach. Um, so I want to talk about, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but Elon Musk, who's of course had been, has been at odds with the SEC for a very long time. Uh, he said he's building a case against the SEC. Uh, and once again, this, all these things packaged together with growing co uh, communities behind uh, crypto coins and digital assets um, you, you know, any thoughts on Elon and what he's looking to do? You mean with respect to his settlement on over the tweet about the potential deal or something bigger? It seems like he's he, from his tweets, he was alluding to something bigger um, and, and he didn't give details, but he's also someone who has a lot of influence. Um, and and I, I think he's in alignment now with a lot of crypto uh, communities and things like that. Um, and once again, it's okay if you're not able to give a, a you know any thoughts on this because it's we don't have full details. But nevertheless, the SEC seems to be under a lot of bad PR uh, uh, situations lately. Yeah, well, um, uh, yeah, I think that there is. Uh, so I've done a few comment letters. I'm I'm in the midst of doing a few comment letters to the SEC, and there's a theme emerging under this SEC of a lack of respect for the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, which is a law that governs independent agencies that requires them to be deliberative in their process, requires them to get comment from the public and listen to that comment and use it, requires them to do economic analysis, cost benefit analysis of their rulemaking. And there's a theme emerging here where this SEC is playing fast and loose with those rules. They've shortened the comment periods. As a commenter, as a frequent commenter myself, it's hard to meet a 60 day comment letter. Uh, you know, when usually they would do 90 and then they've extended past 100 days. No, it's it's as short as could be because he wants to limit as much comment as much as he can. Um, so I, I can see some themes emerging for Administrative Procedures Act based challenges to rulemakings um, across the board. Um, so if Elon wants to learn more about the APA, um, I'd love to talk to him about it because I think there's a lot that could be done. Um, let's talk about the crypto market at large, uh, Bitcoin's adoption and growth. Um, mining is booming in the United States. Um, you have corporates putting Bitcoin in their balance sheet, Tesla and, and MicroStrategy and more. Um, El Salvador has adopted Bitcoin as a legal tender. And, um, you know, we're seeing more members of Congress becoming Bitcoiners. You meant, mentioned Senator Lummis. Um, we're seeing bills being popped up uh, uh, across different states and make Bitcoin a legal tender. Uh, what are your thoughts on how things have grown? Um, and and do, you do, you, do you think we continue to see growth this year and the years to come? Yeah, um, it's, it's uh, you know, all the big banks that used to dismiss this a few years ago, are now, they've had a complete conversion story, which... Um, I, hey, I'm a Christian. I love a good conversion story. Those are the best stories in my religion. So welcome. Welcome to the fold. You are always welcome here. We won't talk about the things you did in the past. You're forgiven for that. And welcome to the fold. Come on in. Chair Clayton is advising Fireblock now. Good. Welcome to the tent. We have a big tent for everyone. I think is the only way, you know, we're all going to make it is, is, is we're all allowed in to the fight to protect the, uh, this, this innovative technology that's going to change the world. It's already changing the world. Um, but it, uh, it, to some extent, uh, so institutional, major institutional adoption is going to help us get retail involved. I worry a little bit about the regulatory attack vector that that opens up. Um, you know, if everybody is buying their crypto on exchange, um, you know, and, and it, it, if, if, if everything's all KYC, what does that do to the more decentralized communities? I, I worry about rules like that, that Canada has 
um, that say that if you send it to a private wallet, you have to know the name of the private wallet you're sending it to. I just I think that's a fundamental threat to to to, to property rights and to and to financial privacy, which I think are fundamental human rights, both of them. Um, so I worry about those. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I think it's certainly promising that we're getting more institutional adoption. Uh, I think on the payment system side, I think the banks are too late, uh, and I, you know they're still connected to a dinosaur payment system that's already been already been beaten. It's just a question of user adoption at this point. But we've already beaten the the uh, you know the, the Fedwire is 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 dead. It's on its it, 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 you know it's gotten a it's gotten a uh, it's gotten a uh, terminal diagnosis. It's just got a little time to spend to wrap up its affairs. I mean, that, that's how I would describe it. So, um, You mentioned the Fed. What are your thoughts on central bank digital currencies? They're essentially taking the blockchain tech, you're tokenizing fiat on it. And it seems like every central bank around the world is looking to do this. I, I've had interviews with members of Congress and, and even Chris Giancarlo, the, the digital dollar project. One of my concerns is, is uh, maintaining the US constitution, right to privacy uh, with a digital dollar CBDC. What are your thoughts on, on the CBDCs and, and the concerns of, of our rights and also the impact on, on the crypto market? Well, I, uh, first, let me just met you mentioned Chris Giancarlo, uh, Crypto Dad. I'm a huge fan of his and we've been friends a long time. This is one of those issues where I disagree with him. I, I, and I have to be careful disagreeing with him because he, he's a very smart guy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I 100% disagree with him on this. I don't think the Fed has any business creating a central bank digital currency. Um, I, I, I just, I, I don't, it might be created now with, with privacy protections. I think eventually they will wither away with time mm -hmm. and uh, they, they will just, uh, because I, we've seen the evolution of Bank Secrecy Act, AML, uh, Patriot Act, uh, uh, it, Federal Incorporation Transparency Act, it only goes in one, the one way ratchet there only goes in one direction. And sometimes it swings wildly. We had the Treasury Department flirting with the idea, thankfully didn't go into law last year, that every transaction over $600 would be reported from your bank account to the Treasury Department, which I, I don't think it's overblown to say that that's a big brother kind of nightmare for financial privacy. So it's only going to go in one, the CBDC is only going to go in one direction. I mean, maybe there are technical controls you can put in place to try to minimize this. Um, that goes beyond my expertise. And I'd love to hear more about that. But I, I have to be convinced. I, I, I fear very much for the notion of a central bank digital currency. And I fear also that it'll crowd out development of stable coins and the more organic um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and diversified development of stable coins we're seeing now, which I think is very valuable that you have different models. They're all competing with each other. You have algorithmics, you have algorithmic with some, with some Bitcoin collateral uh, like Terra, which is so cool. I love the Terra community. Uh, love the, love the lunatics uh, Our USDC, which has got a great model. That's well collateralized and centralized, well collateralized, but very usable tether, uh, which has got, you know, there's a lot of debate about what's backing tether and there've been some issues, but it's also survived for a long time. Um, you know, I think Brian Selkis describes it as the initial rope bridge that we needed to get this done. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's room to improve, but um, CBDC is a threat to all of that innovation. Um, I've seen how the Fed has operated Fedwire, and uh, they are terrible at managing conflicts of interest in their operation of Fedwire. Uh, they will be equally terrible in managing conflicts of interest with respect to a CBDC. So. I have strong views on that, in case you're wondering. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And these are things I think a lot of folks in the community who understand the technology and, and also see what China is doing um, have concerns about. So uh, hopefully they can get it right. Yeah, I, I, I would say my view is China's doing it. We should too. It's not, it's not, the, it's not my usual go-to uh, view. China's doing it. We should not. Is probably usually the best approach for a, for a country based in, in ideals of freedom and liberty. Right. Um, you know, off the branch or, or, or under the umbrella of crypto, we've seen NFTs, uh, a different type okay. of tokenization happening. And then part of that is the metaverse. You know, what are your thoughts on how that has branched off and has been booming? 
Um, yeah, I think NFTs are very, a very cool uh, innovation. Um, I'm not an expert in in uh, in in knowing. You know, I, I, I won't tell your listeners the next collection they should sweep. Um, but I think it's very cool in its own right uh, that that uh, we have a new way to trade in digital art and identity and community. Um, that's all fascinating. Uh, and it's, to some extent, what it's also doing, I think, is just testing out, kind of beta testing, use of non-fungible tokens for identification uh, and for uh, for uh, possession of, of physical property, uh, which could also be, you know, long term, a little bit less sexy than 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 the board apes, but long term is you know, if we could just replace the uniform, a lot of provisions in the uniform commercial code. With NFT-based property ownership, uh, we will have done a great service to international commerce. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, less cool than the board apes, but very lucrative for the economy. I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there are so many uh, applications that, whether it be voting with uh, IDs and insurance policies, certificates, a whole bunch of uh, use cases. Um, all right, we're coming up on time, so I want to hit the wrap-up questions here for you. Uh, if you cr could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me too. I, I love Star yeah. Wars. It would be Star Wars or Blade Runner or something like that. <laughs> oh, Blade Runner. That would be cool. That would be very cool. Yeah, Star Wars. Um, all right. I got some rapid fire questions for you. Favorite yeah. food? Uh, it, it, favorite food? Uh, chicken uh, Parmesan. Uh, favorite musician or band? Uh, Sting and the Police. Roxanne. Oh, I love Sting. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, the Godfather. Favorite book? Um, Sid Hartha. Um, and what do you do for fun as a pastime, as a hobby? Uh, hang out with these guys right here. These are my four boys, <laughs> and they're great. Uh, my nine-year-old asked me the other day, he said, he said, hey, What's up with crypto, my bro? And I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is why I'm doing this. So I got him a wallet. I got it. He said, I said, what do you want to buy? Yeah, I said, oh, you know, I had a little, uh, his allowance this month was going to be in crypto. He, that's what he wanted. Wow. So I said, what are you, what are you doing? And he goes, um, it's Bitcoin and Ethereum, obviously, but I'm also interested in what's going on with Solana. So let's, Solana's cool. I so saw, I was like, that's a good mix, buddy. That's great. So, um, <laughs> So, and he was like, dad, if it grows in my wallet, this is mine. Right. And I was like, well, you know, not your keys, not your coin, buddy. <laughs> but, um, but he's excited. He's learning as, as I am. And, and, uh, we're going to, we're going to next month, we're going to do Jack's, uh, uh, the same way. And, you know, maybe we'll, maybe he's a lunatic. I don't know. We'll see. For sure. Uh, well, JW, great chatting with you, man. Thank you so much for joining me today. Same here. Same here, man. Thanks so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. I love your podcast and, and it's great to be here and hopefully maybe again in the future. Absolutely.